As far as possible, let us kneel for a word of prayer. Loving Father, we thank you so much for the blessing of the Sabbath, the blessing of your word, the opportunity to experience your anointing in our lives. So please, give us the dew, give us the showers, even a refreshing for our souls, that we may be invigorated to renew our walk with Christ and to labor for souls as you lay a burden upon us. So may the fire of Christ burn within. May a love for souls be given us of heaven. Please speak to our hearts through the ministry of your word. May we say, we experienced Jesus today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Now we are going to be building upon the foundation that has been laid in our previous two sermons. We've examined the proof of the fact that all of these events happen on the same day. We have a dark day. We have a Sunday law. We have an earthquake, an invasion of war by China and Russia on American soil. We have an asteroid causing the Wormwood prophecy to fulfill, making the waters bitter. We have a tsunami in the Tampa Bay area. We have communism that falls. China will fall at the dark day. We have a close of probation for Seven Day Adventists, and we have a pastor that dies. All these things happen on the same day. Understand, brothers and sisters, that as we are studying this prophecy, we are building this foundation from Revelation 14, verse 6 through 12, understanding that this is the message for the people that are preparing for the second coming of Jesus as we see the second coming in verse 14 of this chapter. Notice what the Bible says. We're in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7. Notice what it says concerning the first angel's message. It says, Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So take note, here we find the first angel's message giving with a loud voice. That's the first angel. Take note. It brings to view the judgment hour message. Brings to view the judgment hour message. And then we find in verse 9, another message with a loud voice talking about the warning of the beast, the image, and the mark. Notice what it says in verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying, with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And we know that God placed a mark upon Cain because Cain worshiped God a way that was not according to the word of God. And Abel worshiped God the way that the word of God ordained. And as a result, Cain killed Abel. And the Bible says that God placed a mark upon Cain. Understand, Cain was involved in false worship that was not according to the word of God. And Cain killed his brother. So false worship leads to killing others or persecuting others. Therefore, Abel's faith, Abel's worship was by faith, showing his worship would be persecuted. Here you're seeing two groups in the beginning in the book of Genesis showing you the mark of the beast crisis. Whoever you see is persecuted is an identifying mark to know God's true people at the end of time, where the government will legislate a law to kill God's people. Now, as let's come back to the judgment hour. We're seeing a connection between the first angel and the third angel. Now, with these messages, the first angel says that the judgment hour has begun. And we know that now 
that we're living in a time of the judgment of the living. If you have not studied the judgment of the living, I would point you to the playlist on our YouTube channel, which is Saving Health Ministries, is our other YouTube channel. And you go to Saving Health Ministries and the playlist, click on playlist. And once you click on playlist, you'll find there Judgment of the Living. If you study those videos, you'll come to an understanding that we are now in the judgment of the living. And we have known this truth since 2018. Now, in light of the judgment hour message, let's go to Daniel chapter 8. Because the judgment day in the sanctuary system, why do I say the sanctuary? God says in Psalm 77 and verse 13, that thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. In order to understand the ways of God, the things of God, we must understand the sanctuary. And in the sanctuary, there was a day of atonement. And on the day of atonement, you would have the people of God that did not afflict the soul, they were cut off. And it was the day that the sanctuary would be cleansed. It was the day for the sins to be blotted out of the book. It was the day that God would declare who was righteous and who was guilty and who would be removed from the church. Therefore, as we understand this truth, notice what it says, as we are building upon the foundation that has already been laid. If you don't understand what we have already studied, you cannot clearly see what we are going to reveal or what the word of God is going to reveal today in this connection between the first angel and the third angel's message. Daniel 8 and verse 14. Notice what it says. Daniel 8 and verse 14 it says, And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So this judgment hour would only be understood under the cleansing of the sanctuary. And God says, Know ye not that your body is the temple or the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our body belongs to God. Our life belongs to God. If you have chosen Jesus as a personal savior, your life does not belong to you. You cannot choose to just go where you want to go and do what you want to do and eat what you want to eat and dress how you want to dress and live how you want to live. You must live for the glory of God, not for the glory of self. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Therefore, with that understanding, God wants to cleanse this temple of sin. God wants to remove from your heart the love of sin. And just as he desires to do that in your heart, he desires to do this on a corporate scale within the church where he will cleanse the camp of Achans, where he will remove the Achans out of the church, just as in Judges, I'm sorry, just as in Joshua chapter 7, he removed Achan and his family from the church because of their apostasy, because of their sin, and a refusal to acknowledge God as King, as Lord, as Savior. They were removed from the church. God is going to remove some people from the church. We're going to see a cleansing of the church. Didn't Jesus come through with whips and cords and cleanse the church, remove the money changers from the church? Didn't he do that at the first coming? Likewise, at the second coming, he's going to cleanse the church. How can we know when he will do this? We must understand the 2300-day prophecy. And in the 2300-day prophecy, it is connected to the 70-week prophecy. The beginning of the 2300-day prophecy is revealed as you study the 70-week prophecy. The two are interrelated. The two are interconnected. The 70-week prophecy is within the 2300-day prophecy. Therefore, let us look at the 70-week prophecy in Daniel 9. Daniel 9, verse 24 and 25. Daniel 9, verse 24 and 25, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon 
thy holy city. So God is saying, look, I'm giving the Jewish nation 70 weeks. And 70 weeks are 490 literal years. A day equals a year in Bible prophecy. A day equals a year. Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 14, 34 make it clear that a day equals a year in Bible prophecy. All the Protestant reformers agreed upon this point. Martin Luther, who started the Lutheran church. Roger Williams, the first Baptist pastor in America, he taught the same thing. Thomas Kramer, who started the Congregationalist Church. Even John Wesley, who founded the Methodist Church. All the Protestant reformers agreed that a day equals a year in Bible prophecy. All of them taught that at the beginning of those Protestant denominations. All of them taught it. But now those nations or those denominations have become watered down and they may be teaching something different. Now, for 70 weeks, a day, there's seven days in a week. So that would be 490 years concerning literal years. 70 prophetic weeks is 490 literal years. Notice what it goes on to say. 70 weeks are determined upon thy city and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. This is pointing forward to Christ. What would happen in the ministry and the life of Jesus Christ? How he would be anointed at his baptism in 27 AD and how he would die and be crucified in 31 AD. And then it said 70 weeks are determined, meaning 490 years are given for the Jewish nation. And the Jews would be cut off when? 34 AD. That was their close of probation at 490 years, which was the 34 AD. Notice what it goes on to say. Verse 25, when would this prophecy begin? When would be the beginning of the 70 weeks and the 2,300 2, days? When would that prophecy begin? Verse 25 gives us the answer. It says, we're in Daniel 9, 25. It says, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. In what kind of times? Troublous times. Are we living in troublous times today? Absolutely. Are there even current events that are showing us that we are living in troublous times? Absolutely. Notice here on the screen, Indonesia earthquake, 10,000 people flee, buildings flatten in Sulawesi Island, 6.2 magnitude earthquake struck the city. Brothers and sisters, this was right around 1 a.m. Can you imagine in the middle of the night waking up to an earthquake, killing at least 37 people? Officials say there could be a tsunami if more strong quakes hit Sulawesi Island. Well, notice another article considering this. And we know that an earthquake is coming on the dark day. We see that in Amos 8, 8 through 10, there will be a tsunami. I'm sorry, there will be an earthquake at, at the same time a tsunami at the dark day, according to Amos 8, 8 through 10. Notice here. Powerful earthquake in Indonesia's Sulawesi kills at least 67 people, injures hundreds. Brothers and sisters, we are living in troublous times. Troublous times. Even worse than many of you realize. Why do I say this? There are multiple governments around the world that are collapsing. Governments are collapsing around the world. Notice here. Dutch government collapses in fallout from child benefit scandal. We have political corruption all over the world. We have scandals all over the world. We're living in troublous times. Bible prophecy is fulfilling. And Jesus said that there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars with distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Jesus prophesied it and we are seeing it fulfilled even now. Notice. 
Another government falling. It says, Kuwait government ministers resign in mass. In other words, a multitude of them resigning. Where? Kuwait. What's going on in Italy? Italy plunged into political crisis. Government risk collapse. Governments are collapsing around the world. Here, another one. Government resigns in Guinea. Prime Minister submits government's resignation to the president. Entire governments, brothers and sisters, are resigning. Governments are collapsing. Here it says, Estonia, government collapse in massive corruption scandal. And all these articles are just from the last week and a half. This is January 13, just this week. Another article, it says, Israel's government collapses, not with a bang, but a whimper, tri triggering fourth election in two years. This is from last month, December 22nd, 2020. Brothers and sisters, and even as we consider this, even now, we know that there are troops in, the Amer in America's capital, in D.C., as a result of the situation of armed protest and riots planned for the inauguration of Joe Biden, which we know will not take place, or I should say Biden will not serve as president in America. We have troops in the Capitol. Notice what it says. Over 20,000 National Guard troops to provide security against inauguration threats in Washington. Another one, up to 25,000 National Guard in D.C. Look, they have some serious weapons, lethal weapons they are carrying. Brothers and sisters, we are living in troublous times. So it is clear, based upon what we are seeing, that not only governments are collapsing, but we see chaos and anarchy in our world, even at a time as... Bible prophecy is fulfilling. So I want us to see that the wall was rebuilt in troublous times. In other words, in hardship. Aren't we told that what the church failed to do in a time of peace, that she will have to do under the most discouraging circumstances? Aren't we told? Brothers and sisters, Daniel 9 gives us a decree for the beginning of the 70 weeks prophecy and the 2300 day prophecy. In other words, there is a law that is given, there is a decree that is given that begins the start of the prophecy. In other words, in order for these prophecies to fulfill, it must be connected to a law. That which hath been is that which shall be. Just as there was a the sanctuary cleanse, meaning God removing unsanctified ministers and a close of probation upon the Jews began based upon a decree, based upon a decree that was given by, and we know that there were three decrees that were given that allowed for the walls to be rebuilt. There were three decrees given and understand also that Medo-Persia is a type of America. Medo-Persia is a type of America. America is called a two-horned beast in Revelation 13, 11, and Medo-Persia is called a two-horned beast in Daniel 8, 20. America follows spiritual Babylon in chronology, in Bible prophecy, as well as Medo-Persia follows literal Babylon in chronology, in Bible prophecy. America will issue a religious law with a death penalty, Medo-Persia issued a religious law with the death penalty in Daniel 6 and in Esther, in the book of Esther. So America is called a glorious land in Daniel 11, verse 41, and Medo-Persia is called a glorious kingdom in Esther 1, I believe, verse 4. So we see these four similarities, and the Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Therefore, we're standing on a strong foundation with four witnesses. So now, let us come over to the book of Ezra. Ezra. 
So let me make sure we get, we get this strong point, this important point. It says, in order to know when the sanctuary would be cleansed and the close of probation for the Jews, it was based upon a decree. It says, know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. So once the commandment went forth, once the decree went forth, once the law went forth, that's when the building, the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of the wall would begin. That's what the Lord is showing us. Likewise, in order to know when the walls will be rebuilt in these last days, it will be based upon when the Sunday law is given. Do we know when that is? No, we do not. But we know we're living in the fourth generation. We know that we're living at a time where we see all these events are on the verge of fulfilling. We see tensions between America, China, and Russia. We see that we have earthquakes. We see that this war is, on, is about to begin. We see that there are asteroids and stones and space rocks that are just missing Earth. Very soon, we're going to see all these events happen on the same day, and it is based upon when the Sunday legislation comes into view. And once that happens, you know on that day, it will go dark, and these will fulfill on that same day. We're now in our Bibles, in the book of Ezra, chapter 1. And we're going to examine these three decrees, just as there was a decree given in Medo-Persia, that began to, the understanding of the sanctuary being cleansed and the close of probation for the Jews. Likewise, for God's last day Jews, Seventh-day Adventists, that we may understand the close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists and when the sanctuary will be cleansed where unsanctified ministers will be removed. Notice what it says. We're in the book of Ezra, Chapter 1. And as we understand these four decrees that are given by Medo Persia, then we can understand the four steps or the four stages of the Sunday law to get to the death decree. The, fight, the fourth stage will be the death decree, but there are three steps before that death decree. So there's a total of four stages when you understand the Sunday law. Notice what it says. Again, we're in Ezra 1, Ezra 1, and notice what it says in verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, so here's the decree, here's the law. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people, his God? Be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord, God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place Help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts beside the freewill offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites and with all them whose spirit God hath raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts and with precious things beside all that was willingly offered. So here we're seeing the decree by Cyrus to begin the building of the wall, the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So the first decree was by Cyrus, which means the first legislation of Sunday will be light. It will not be a death decree immediately. It will first be, well, we need to take a rest on Sunday. We need to not do anything, not go out of our homes, not drive, not do things on Sunday. We need to relax on Sunday. We need to lower the emissions 
for Sunday. Is that what we're seeing in our world? Well, you, in other words, the first decree may issue businesses closed on Sunday and, you know, take a day of rest. Don't do anything on Sunday. That will it will be like that first degree. I'm not saying exactly. I'm just giving you a, a hypothetical. But this will be in four stages when we understand this Sunday law. So just as there were four decrees in Medo-Persia, we will see four decrees in America. Let's go to another article that shows us that we are here, brothers and sisters, what's happening in the Capitol. In D.C., where they have soldiers right now, it says, Capitol Market to close on Sundays due to COVID-19. So what are they doing in the Capitol now? They're closing the stores. The Capitol Market has announced changes to their hours due to the COVID-19 pandemic. A release from the Capitol Market says that they will be closed on Sundays from January the 17th until April 11th. Soho's will also be closed on Sundays. So what are they doing now on Sundays? Businesses are closing on Sundays, and this is the Capitol. This is in Washington, D.C. Capitol Market. Therefore, understand, brothers and sisters, very soon we will see legislation to close all businesses on Sunday. And that may be the first legislation or the first decree or the first stage of the Sunday law. Are we seeing even more tribulation in our world? Notice here, it says, China must exploit crippled Trump administration's final days, state media chief. So China must exploit crippled Trump administration's final days? Could something happen in these final days? We will see. Time will tell. Am I saying something is going to happen? No. But I do know that Trump is the last president of Bible prophecy. We will see this fulfilled with our eyes. Notice here, political crisis, a golden opportunity for electric grid and internet attack. They are stating that an EMP or an attack on the electrical grid via cyber war from either Russia or China or North Korea or Iran could take place, it says. Reading from here, it says, the U.S. political crisis is being closely watched by Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran as a potential golden opportunity for aggression, including the worst-case nuclear electromagnetic pulse attack. That's the EMP, where everything will go dark. All the electrical grids would be negatively, negatively affected, and you could expect a blackout to take place. It's coming, brothers and sisters. Blackouts are coming. Very soon, blackouts are coming. So understand, God is showing us that as we see the armed protests, the riots, the chaos, the anarchy in America, our enemies are watching and are seeking for an opportunity to gain advantage of America. We are in a political crisis. We are in a national crisis. We are even in a religious crisis in our world. Doesn't look like you got the opportunity to see that. Did you get a chance to see it? Political crisis here in this article and this other one. Just want to make sure we got you got a chance to see that. Capital market to close on Sundays due to COVID-19. So with that, brothers and sisters, God is showing us that we are living in perilous times where we are on the verge of Sunday legislation in our world. Now, we dealt with the first decree, and let us move on and see what else happened under the first decree. Come over to chapter 3 and verse 11. We're in chapter 3 and verse 11. Notice what it says in Ezra 3 and verse 11. And again, this is under the first decree. The first decree. It says, and they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So notice that there was a great shout. So under the first decree, 
under the first decree, what did you have? You had a great shout. So you'll have loud cry. Talking about a loud cry under the first decree. This is what allowed the message to swell under the first decree. Now, come over to chapter 4, and let's begin in verse 3, and notice what happens. Whatever happened at the first decree in Cyrus' day is going to happen at the first decree in our day under President Trump. Notice what it says. Esther 4 and verse 3, it says, But Zerubbabel and Joshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, king of Persia, hath commanded us. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. So they were building in troublous times. So they had opposition in building. So anyone that is building that is not facing opposition is not really building. In other words, you have to pay attention to who is being opposed, what ministry is facing opposition, and those ministries are the ministries that God is using to build the walls of Jerusalem, to build the walls of Jerusalem, to restore the foundations of many generations. So, in light of this, notice what happens in verse 6. I'm sorry, verse 5 and 6. It says, And hired counselors against them, talking about against God's people, to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even unto the reign of Darius, king of Persia, and in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him in accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. So take note, there were laws that were passed that were against them. There were a laws that were passed that were opposing the people of God. So you're talking about restrictive laws being passed. Restrictive laws being passed. Are we seeing that today? Or have they said under COVID-19 that you cannot congregate more than 10 or more than 50 in certain states? Or even where you cannot congregate at all in certain states under COVID-19? We're seeing that we're living in troublous times. But we haven't seen the first decree yet of Sunday. But let us see what is happening in our world as we examine some of the other articles that bring to view the, the, the draconian laws that are being passed. Notice here what it says. Governor Phil Murphy seizes 165000 bank account of Jim that opened during extended small business lockdown. So the government in New Jersey goes into the gym owner's bank account and takes 165000 while they're in the middle of the court case. Brothers and sisters, we are living in troublous times. Doesn't Revelation 13 and verse 17 say that as many that you will not be able to buy or sell except you take the mark? Seeing controlling your finances, we're seeing it here. Controlling their finances. Here's another one confirming it. It says, New Jersey governor wipes out Jim's bank account for remaining open in defiance of lockdown. We actually released a video of the interview that this gym owner did with Tucker Carlson on Fox News. We released a video of this yesterday on our backup channel, which we are live streaming from right now. We released a video yesterday. You can go watch it. It's a short video showing the interview of what he encountered and what he went through. Brothers and sisters, we are seeing restrictive laws, totalitarian government. You are seeing communism in America. This is communism. To go into their bank account and take their money without their permission, no liberty, no freedom, that's communism. That's America speaking as a dragon. And that's not federal. This is the state, which means we could see the enforcement of Sunday begin in the States. It's a possibility. Am I saying that that's how it's going to play out? Only God knows. But it's a possibility. So understand, brothers and sisters, we're seeing restrictive laws that will hinder the work of God's people. Restrictive laws are coming. We are already seeing it, but there are more that are coming. 
Now, let's see what else happened under the first decree. Under the first decree. Notice what it says in Ezra 4, verse 23 and 24. Ezra 4, verse 23 and 24. It says, Now when the copy of King Ahartaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai, the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem unto the Jews and made them to cease by force and power. Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, so it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. What do we see now? We see churches closing willingly. Churches closing because they're afraid of COVID-19. Any church that is closed without a mandate by the government is showing they have no faith in Christ. Again, any church now that is closed under COVID-19 because they're afraid of catching COVID-19 and not because of a mandate by the government, it shows they are not walking by faith, but walking by fear. They're not walking by faith, they're walking by fear. Now's the time for us to work aggressively while we have opportunity because soon they're going to shut the churches. Soon martial law is going to be declared. Soon lockdown is going to be ensued. And as a result, we have to work aggressively, quickly, efficiently now while we have the opportunity. What else happened under the first decree? Notice what it says. Ezra 5 verse 1, it says, Then the prophets of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Edo prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedach, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. So take note that there was prophesying as the wall were being built under the first decree of the Sunday law. Number C, prophesying. Prophesying. And understand, prophesying doesn't have to be by one person. It can be by multiple. Because Joel 2 and Acts chapter 2 makes it clear, God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Old men dream dreams, young men see visions. Very clear. So there will be prophesying under the first decree given. Now, let's move on to the second decree now in chapter 6. The second decree in chapter 6. Notice, I'm sorry, yes. Chapter 6 and beginning in verse 1. Notice what it says. Then Darius, the king, made a decree and search was made in the house of Rose, where the treasures were laid in Babylon. Skip down to verse 3. In the first year of Cyrus, the king of the king same Cyrus, the king made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be builded, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundation thereof be strongly laid, the height thereof three score cubits, and the breadth thereof three score cubits. So now, rebuilding the wall. After it stopped under the first decree, now, under Darius, it would continue to build. So there was a second decree. A second decree from Darius. Darius, you have the second decree for the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the walls. Skip down to verse 11. Notice what it says. Talking about Darius. Also, I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, let timber be pulled down from his house, being set up, let him be hanged thereon, and let his house be made a dunghill for this. And the God that hath caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people that shall put their hand to the altar and destroy this house of God, which is at Jerusalem, I, Darius, have made a decree. So you're seeing again, the second stage of the Sunday law, the second decree here by Darius. Then it says in verse 13, Then Tatnai, governor, on this side of the river, shut that word Bajnai, and their companions, according to that which Darius the king had sent, so they did speedily, and the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered through the prophesying 
of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo, and they builded and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And we know that Persia is a type of America. So there were three decrees, three decrees. The third one was Artaxerxes. The third decree was Artaxerxes. Now understand, brothers and sisters, that these are the three decrees that allowed the walls to be built. In other words, for all of God's people to be sealed because the rebuilding of the walls mean you are sealing, you are doing a work that involves making sure that souls are sealed, that souls are keeping and obeying the Ten Commandments. What does it say in the, regarding the Ten Commandments? God says that we are to honor the seventh day Sabbath, which is Saturday, which is a sign of the fact that you have ceased from sin as you are walking by faith in Christ. Now Jesus is living out his life through you as you surrender daily to whatever God shows you. This is the experience of righteousness by faith. You obey what the word says, regardless of the consequence. You obey what the word says, regardless of what people think. You obey what the word says once you have two or three witnesses, regardless of what the result may be, you do what the Bible says and leave consequences with God. That is faith. That is faith. So understand, you have three decrees. The third decree, you can just write it down. We won't read it. Ezra 7, Ezra 7, verse 11 through the end of the chapter is the decree from Artaxerxes. Again, Ezra 7, 11 through the end of the chapter, that's the third decree by Artaxerxes. And the final decree, the fourth decree, is in the book of Esther. So you have four decrees that are coming from Medo-Persia, which is a type of America, to lead to the death decree, and that fourth one is the death decree. So understand, first one will be, you know, very easy. Just take a rest on Sunday. Everybody rest. The next one, the second law, the second stage where we have Darius may be where, you know, everybody has to go to church on Sunday. You know, and they still allow you to worship on Saturday, but everybody has to go to church on Sunday. That may be the second stage. And then the third stage may be where they don't allow you to go to church on Sabbath where you are prevented from worshiping the Lord on the Sabbath. That may be the third stage. And where we will literally become homeless as a result. Just as we see they took the money out of the account of the gym owner, we will not be able to buy or sell, as it says in Revelation 13 and verse 17. So with that, brothers and sisters, let us move on to the book of Esther. Let's go to the book of Esther, chapter 3. Esther, chapter 3. Notice what it says as we begin in verse 13. This is the death penalty. Esther 3, beginning in verse 13, this is the death penalty. So we see four decrees in Medo-Persia against God's people, or four decrees that are given showing us the final step now in Esther, when the death decree is given, and that will be the final stage of the Sunday law. Notice what it says, Esther 3 and verse 13. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. So you're seeing the death decree here in Esther 3 and verse 13. And you can write down through Esther 4 and verse 3, but it's really the rest of the book deals with this death decree is what it deals with. So the reason I'm bringing this up, because there are four stages to the Sunday law. First, they're going to say, hey, we need to take a rest. It's probably going to be for climate change. It's probably going to be for the environment. Matter of fact, let's see what they are discussing currently in light of this environment 
that they are seeking to save the planet. And we know that Pope Francis, in his recent Laudato Si, has stated that Sunday is the solution for climate change. Here, notice what it says. This was three days ago. It says, greenhouse gas emissions in the United States were lowest since World War II, with many U.S. cities in varying stages of shutdown for parts of 2020, travel was reduced, and so were greenhouse gas emissions. So you can expect in your area for them to say, hey, we need to not be driving on Sunday. We need to take a rest, take a day off on Sunday. And that's exactly what the Green Sabbath Project is projecting. It says, is there nothing you can do about the environment? Nothing may be one of the best things you can do. One day every week, do nothing. On what day? On Sunday. On Sunday. Green Sabbath. Take a weekly day of rest, they say. Make it a real Sabbath for you, for Earth. Don't drive, don't shop, don't build. Take a walk, eat with your friends, play with and read with your kids. Sing and meditate. Brothers and sisters, we know that God's true day of worship is Saturday, Friday sundown until Saturday sundown. But what is the world pushing? To save the planet, to, to, to take a Sabbath for the earth. No, God says take a Sabbath so that you can, you can reconnect with him, so that you can take time to know him, that you can know him as a personal savior on the Sabbath. This is what the Lord has ordained. But man is wanting you to worship the created thing, to worship the sun on the first day of the week, because that is what Sunday worship originally came from. So this is what we're seeing with the Green Sabbath Project. Brothers and sisters, we are on the verge of serious times in our world. Serious times. Now, as we continue this understanding, we'll come to this later. We're not going to deal with this now. We'll deal with this later. We'll come back to that. So notice here, as we understand that we are at a time where we will not be able to buy or sell is where we're headed. If that's the case, we must learn to walk by faith now. We need the faith of Jesus now. And just as President Donald Trump is being cut off from his businesses, from the PGA, that's the, I believe, the, the golfing association. The PGA, they're no longer holding their golf events, their golf tournaments at Trump's locations, showing us that he is being cut off. He is being persecuted. He is, they banned him on Twitter, they banned him on Instagram, they banned him on uh, social media, and as a result now, his finances are being cut off while they have misrepresented his words. Because in the speech, President Trump actually said, we need to go peacefully and patriotically go protest. He never said to be violent. He never said to invade. He never said to cause harm. His words are being misrepresented by the public. The evidence is on screen. All the evidence is there, but he's being misrepresented. Likewise, that is what's going to happen to us. Just as uh, First Amendment, his speech, freedom of speech is being taken away and his finances are being cut off, the same thing is coming for us. Trump, you're seeing a foreshadowing of the church all through his presidency. Why? Because he is the, la we, he is the final president on the last trumpet. We are at the final trumpet, and you're, what you're seeing happen with Trump is happening to the church. Just as he was impeached twice, he was tried and found guilty or found innocent, whether the Senate or the House. Likewise, you and I are now being tried in the judgment of the living, where your name, my name, can come up at any time in this judgment hour, and God will either say, thou art found wanting, or God will say, their sins have been blotted out. It will be one or the other. You are without fault, without sin before the Father. Let's turn in our Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. I want you to understand, now is the time for the faith of Jesus. What does that mean? It means to walk by every word of God, and that means where you give up what you want for what God desires, for what God wants. Where we crucify the flesh, we die to self, self must decrease, that Christ may increase, which means you're going to lose your reputation, which means you're going to be misunderstood, which means 
people will persecute you just as Trump is being persecuted right now. Galatians 2 and verse 20. The Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. That's the faith of Jesus. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Self must die that Christ may live, which means you're going to lose your reputation. You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your home. You're going to lose that family member. You, you may lose your spouse. You may lose your children. Your parents may disown you, but Jesus will receive you by faith as we walk by every word of God. This is the experience of the 140 and 4,000. What does it say in Isaiah 8 and verse 16? It says, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. The faith of Christ enables you to live an obedient life to the law of God, to the full conformity of the law of God, where you bring your life in obedience to, the, to every aspect of God's law. This is what we're understanding, brothers and sisters. Meanwhile, Trump has been bridging church and state. We have seen Trump vow to unite church and state. He has removed the Johnson Amendment. He has embraced the evangelicals, and they have embraced him. He has embraced Catholics. He said he's going to stand side by side with Catholics. We've seen that he has hi hired many Catholics in his administration. His prior acting chief of staff was Catholic, Mick Mulvaney. The current or the, the recent um, Department of Justice head, William Barr, he was Catholic. Trump is married to a Catholic uh, in Milana Trump. He has visited shrines of Pope John Paul and paying homage at those shrines. We are seeing a president that is uniting church and state, and he says he wants to fight religious persecution, but the Bible says when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come. Notice here how Trump is uniting church and state. Donald Trump marked the 850th anniversary of the death of English Archbishop Thomas Beckett in 1170 while calling for an end to religious persecution worldwide. Trump said in a proclamation on Monday, On this day we celebrate and revere Thomas Beckett's courageous stand for religious liberty and we reaffirm our call to end religious persecution worldwide. To honour Thomas Beckett's memory, the crimes against people of faith must stop. Prisoners of conscience must be released. Laws restricting freedom of religion and belief must be repealed. And the vulnerable, the defenseless and the oppressed must be protected. As long as America stands, we will always defend religious liberty. A society without religion cannot prosper. A nation without faith cannot endure because justice, goodness and peace cannot prevail without the grace of God, Trump said at the end of the proclamation. What does that say? A society without religion cannot prosper, a nation without God cannot succeed. We are seeing brothers and sisters, they are saying we want God. What does that mean? You are going to see Sunday enforced as the law of the land in America. Now understand, America has had diplomatic relations with the Vatican for almost 40 years. Since 1984, since 1984, there has been diplomatic relations between America and the Vatican, which is, which is totally opposed to the principles that founded this constitution in America, where our government will make no law respecting the establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free, ex excuse me, the free exercise thereof. Notice here on the screen what it says concerning concerning Callista Gingrich, and this was released by Crux News. Notice what it says. As Callista Gingrich departs, she's the new coat in U.S. Vatican ties. In coat, that means challenge of all time. So here you have Newt Gingrich and his wife, Callista Gingrich, who was the U.S. ambassador to the Vatican and we see that the, that the relationship between America and the Vatican has strengthened. 
We know that the first beast of Revelation 13 is the Vatican. That's the Roman Catholic system. And the second beast of Revelation 13 is America. And, you, and we are seeing these relationships strengthen. Brothers and sisters, we are on the verge of seeing even the dream of Ellen White fulfill and how she prophesied that there would be a, a, a turning by God, from, of God's people towards Catholicism. Notice here what it says on the screen. Seventh Day Adventist Church buys former blessed sacrament in Northampton. So brothers and sisters, what we are seeing here is apostasy from the truth, a departing from the faith by those that profess to believe the people of, or that profess to be the people of God. This is a departure from the faith. Notice here what it goes on to say in this article. It says, a growing Seventh-day Adventist congregation based in Florence brought, I'm sorry, bought the former Blessed Sacrament Church at 354 Elm Street for $455,000. So they bought this church for $455,000. It goes on to say, in the bold section here in the blue, the, the, the diocese sells real estate with a deed restriction prohibiting any use inconsistent with the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, in other words, there are stipulations in this contract. There are strings attack, attached in the purchase of this building. It says, but, I'm sorry, let me reread that line. The diocese sells real estate with a deed restriction prohibiting any use inconsistent with the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church as determined by the bishop. Brothers and sisters, this is apostasy because how can you profess to, believe, to be a seven-day Adventist where we are to expose Rome and her daughters in light of Sunday enforcement, which is coming upon America very soon, we know that Sunday will be enforced. How will this bishop then allow you to preach against what the government is saying is the law of the land? How will this, this church be able to do the work that we are called to do at this time? This is basically a gift of $455,000. This is apostasy, brothers and sisters. And many are saying we can't have self-supporting churches. It shows how blind we are at this hour and what needs to be done that the truth of God may go forward without hindrance and without the interference of man. Brothers and sisters, this is a trap. This is a gift from the SDA church to the Roman Catholic Church. Matter of fact, let's look at another section, another problem in why they should not have bought this building. Notice here, I'm reading from the bold section. It says, that includes, matter of fact, no, I'm going to start from here, the paragraph above it. It says, he doesn't expect to have his congregation worship at the former Blessed Sacrament until at least summer. COVID-19 not only makes it hard to meet, he said, but also slows the work his church wants to accomplish at the building. That includes remediating a mold problem. So there's mold in the building. That's danger to your health. The Catholic diocese cited mold in the building as the reason it stopped worshiping there. So can you imagine? A Seventh-day Adventist church, well, first, a Catholic church is using this building. They stop using it because of mold, because they don't want to endanger their health. But then they turn around and sell the building for $455,000 to an SDA church with stipulations, with strings attached, which must be approved by the bishop in order to engage in your activities while there's a mold issue. Brothers and sisters, we are giving money away, which shows why God is going to judge very soon. This, this is apostasy. This is, a, this is a sad situation of what we see going on in the church, brothers and sisters. This, this is apostasy from the truth. But matter of fact, this is a fulfillment of Ellen White's dream and what she saw 
concerning the church. This is why there is great need of more self-supporting churches, more self-supporting ministries. Why do I say it's a fulfillment of the dream? I'm reading from first volume of the testimonies, first volume of the testimonies, page 578, 578. First volume of the testimonies, page 578, it says, that night I dreamed that I was in Battle Creek, looking out from the side glass at the door and saw a company marching up to the house two and two. They looked stern and determined. I knew them well and turned to open the parlor door to receive them, but I thought I would look again. The scene was changed. The company now presented the appearance of a Catholic procession. One bore in his hand a cross, another a reed. And as they approached, the one carrying a reed made a circle around the house, saying three times, this house is prescribed, the goods must be confiscated. This house is prescribed, the goods must be confiscated. They said this three times. Then it goes on to say, they have spoken against our holy order. Terror seized me and I ran through the house out of the north door and found myself in the midst of a company, some of whom I knew, but I dared not speak a word to them for fear of being betrayed. I tried to seek a retired spot where I might weep and pray without meeting eager inquisitive eyes wherever I turned. I repeated frequently, if I could only understand this, if they will tell me what I have said or what I have done. I wept and prayed much as I saw our goods confiscated. I tried to read sympathy or pity for me in the looks of those around me and marked the countenances of several whom I thought would speak to me and comfort me if, I, if they did not fear that they would be observed by others. I made one attempt to escape the crowd, but seeing that I was watched, I concealed my intentions. I commenced weeping aloud and saying, if they would only tell me what I have done or what I have said. My husband who was sleeping in a bed in the same room heard me weeping aloud and awoke me. My pillow was wet with tears and a sad depression of spirits was upon me. Brothers and sisters, we are seeing Ellen White's dream being fulfilled even now. And this is done openly, not considering the covert Jesuits that are working within and the Jesuits that are writing in the Sabbath school lesson. Brothers and sisters, I've said it and I'll say it again. You are better off reading the spirit of prophecy and studying your Bible than doing that Sabbath school lesson because you're not going to get an understanding of the message of the hour or tuning in to ministries on YouTube that are preaching the first, the second, and third angel's message. You're much better off doing that than going to and supporting a local church that is an apostasy. Now, am I saying every church is an apostasy? No, I am not saying that every church, but the majority definitely are. And now's the hour to separate from apostasy, whether in the general conference or outside the general conference. We as God's children are to separate from apostasy. How do we show that from the Bible? Second Timothy three and verse five says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. You can also write down second Thessalonians chapter three, and verse six, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. You can also write down Romans 16 and verse 17. Also, Second Thessalonians 3 Yes, yeah, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 14. These are all clear scriptures where we are to separate from apostasy. And this is why the 144,000 
are not defiled with women. Just as we see that Sister White in the closing days of her life, in the last 15 years, you see most of her work was in self-supporting lines. It was not in the general conference. And this is why she stated, we need 100 workers to come out of the general conference into self-supporting lines. That is what she wrote with her own pen. Therefore, understand, brothers and sisters, now's the hour to prepare for the second coming. Now's the hour to exercise faith and walk by the word. Now's the hour to be totally surrendered to Jesus as we see church and state uniting, and very soon a law will be enforced against God's commandment-keeping people. Notice here as we close in some of these articles that show us that we are truly at the end of earth's history. Notice here what is happening to Seventh-day Adventists. It says, Seventh-day Adventists, Sue's former employer, claims discrimination. Louis Ruiz Escobar says he was fired after refusing to work on Saturdays, which would violate his faith. He was what? Fired for refusing to work on Saturdays. Brothers and sisters, it's coming to you very soon. It's coming. It's coming. Another article, it says, the United States is set for a flurry of Christian nationalist bills advanced by the religious right. A flurry of what? Christian nationalist bills. In other words, we are going to see Sunday very soon in force. The article doesn't say Sunday. It talks about, you know, laws to erode LGBT rights and, and abortion, anti-abortion laws and such and such. But brothers and sisters, persecution is here. Notice what is happening to the Parlor CEO, which is a conservative social media site. Parlor CEO, John Metz, family forced into hiding due to death threats, security breaches filing. Brothers and sisters, they are threatening the life of the parlor CEO. If they are doing that to him, what do you think is coming for God's commandment keeping people, professed Seventh-day Adventists and Sabbath keepers? Oh, we are living in perilous times. Notice here another article that says, Trump is putting the machinery of death into overdrive. After 17 years without a federal execution in the United States, the Trump administration has gone on what can only be called a killing spree. Brothers and sisters, the death penalty is back. Notice here it says, the US government has executed 10 people this year, the most since 1896. Now that's over a hundred years. That's over a century ago. We are in perilous times in 2021. Another article here, it says, U.S. government executes woman for the first time in nearly seven decades. Brothers and sisters, this is all under the Trump administration who is the last president of Bible prophecy. You will see with your own eyes miraculous events in the near future. Trump will remain president in America. Here, notice. Now, what is a woman representing Bible prophecy? A woman represents the church. And here is a woman after how many decades? Seven decades. What does seven represent? Completion, perfection. We are seeing God is wanting us to bring the Sabbath truth, the seventh day Sabbath truth to those who know it not. Why? Because the seven last plagues are going to be poured out on those who reject his seven-day Sabbath. Notice here, another article confirming what is happening. Here it says, federal government executes first woman in nearly 70 years. Brothers and sisters, we are at the end. The Trump administration has brought back federal death penalty, and now women are being executed, and we know that a woman represents a church in Bible prophecy, which means the death penalty is soon coming to the church. Our last scripture, Revelation 13, notice what it says. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 15, notice what it says. 
And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. A death penalty is coming to commandment keepers. What does it say in Revelation 12 and verse 17? And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The war is with those that keep all ten of the commandments and have the gift of prophesying of prophecy manifested amongst them. Brothers and sisters, we are at the end. Will your anchor hold in the storm of life? When the strong tides blow, will your anchor hold is the question. Are you building upon the rock or are you building upon the sand? Now's the time for you and for me and for you and for you to live by every word of God. Let us stand with Jesus upon the word, no matter what persecution may come, whether you lose your job, whether you lose your house, whether you lose your children, whether you lose your spouse, whether you lose everything you own and your reputation, so be it. Let us be found hidden in Christ as we approach troublous times in America and the entire world. Will you surrender at this hour? Will you give Christ your life? Will you give him all? Will you surrender all is the question. Let us surrender all before it is forever too late. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. And we pray for our brothers and sisters that are in apostasy. You see the disregard for your law. You see the, the disregard for even your finances to waste your money on a building of mold that is with stipulations in the Catholic Church. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Please cleanse us of all unrighteousness, and may we make the time necessary, both by prayer and searching of your, of your word, that we may be transformed into the image of Jesus. Please restore your image in us and seal and save us is our prayer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.